This is episode one of the Say Something Smart video game podcast, the one where Angel and Stephanie interview creative mastermind Ron Davis, president of Reactuate Games. Welcome to the Say Something Smart video game podcast. Every week, Angel and Stephanie interview gaming insiders. They talk about gaming and life and how the two intersect. The Say Something Smart podcast is a production of Reactuate Games, a cool game studio doing their development in the open. If you'd like to see what life is like for a small indie dev team, check us out at reactuategames.com. Now, here's your hosts. Welcome to the Say Something Smart podcast. I'm Stephanie Whitlow. And I'm Angel, the director of Awesome. So, according to Wired's website, in Germany, the National Anti-Doping Agency wants to make drug testing mandatory for professional gamers. There's news of players taking Adderall at high prize competitions, allowing them to have, quote, higher levels of concentration, alertness, and energy. Their appetites go away, and they don't get tired. So what are your thoughts? Well, I was in the competitive scene for quite a while. So you want things to be balanced so that whoever wins, you know that it was fair, and you don't get upset, and everybody wants to be on the same level uh, playing field. But at the same time, you want to have that edge so that you can beat someone. So... I remember in one of my first competitions, I was going through, I don't even know how many cans of NOS at the time and Red Bull to get that energy where you felt like you wanted to wrestle a rhinoceros, you know, trying to get that win. But uh, I I actually agree with this. I think it should be a level playing field. I will have to say the first time I read this, I kind of laughed because I thought it was silly. But after reading some more stuff on it, I can understand how, you know, people need to keep their edge. If they're playing all-day competitions and trying to go for millions of dollars in winnings. I can understand that. Um, Something I did read though, that it's unfair for people with ADHD that need to take those kinds of drugs. Mm. I don't know. Mm. I can see that. Ron, what do you think? Adderall. You know, it's college campuses, right? I mean, everybody does it for finals. There's like a black market in Adderall. Well, I guess there's a black market in amphetamines, <laughs> yeah. generally. Yeah. But a black market in college is uh, for Adderall. Because a lot of kids are prescribed Adderall for ADHD, and so they have a ready supply. Mm. But then the question is, if you, if you say, okay, you, we're going to test everybody for Adderall, and you just have to show up with a prescription if you already have to take it, which there's a huge population. Adderall is like in the top five most prescribed drugs in America. So... If you have that, then people just go get a prescription for it. Mm. Well, I'd be interested to see how, where they go with this. Because I, I know for one thing, if, if I'm competing and I'm doing it clean, so to speak, you know, and then I go against someone, come to find out they're using something to get an unfair advantage, then I would be upset. I would take it personal. So I could definitely understand them trying to work on it to make it even, even definitely. So could, how would you feel as a pro gamer? You walk into your gaming thing and they're like, here's your cup. <laughs> I, uh, you know, it, for me, I, I, it wouldn't bother me too much, you know, because we had to get testing back when I was doing uh, wrestling in high school and then when I was doing martial arts and, and of course, being in the military. So yeah. testing for me is, is no problem. I don't have, a, I don't have an issue. So they, like, test you randomly throughout the day? Uh, yeah, actually, they'll, they'll test us randomly. They say it's random, but I get, I get popped every time I come back from New York. So. No, I was just playing. I was just <laughs> well, I'm just saying, in a, in a gaming competition, right? I mean, it's Adderall. It's not like it, it's just a little pill. Like, you go get your drug test at the beginning, and then you're like two games in, and that's when you start getting tired. You're like, ooh, taking the Adderall. And then they'd have to, so they'd have to test people all through the day yeah, to find out whether or not they were starting to pop out. I think that's, they might even get it to random. So yeah. if it's if it becomes a random thing, then that's something you would have to worry about. So yeah. that might keep you from doing it. But then that. on the other hand, are you also going to test for, like, huge doses of of caffeine? Because, yeah, you you can't take 10 milligrams of Adderall, yeah. mm-hmm. but you can take 16 Red Bulls. Uh, that's, that's true. And that's, and that's another thing they were talking about is you can't – some people don't get enough sleep before a competition. How are we going to make the – you know, it all fair. Some people don't eat well or some people – you know, so it's like, when do we just say, do what you need to do personally? Yeah. Mm. I think, I guess the deal is they don't, they want to eliminate addictive drugs from it. Yeah. So the question is, is caffeine addictive? I don't know. Yes. But uh, Adderall is definitely an addictive drug, and that's why it's a, that's why it's such a thing when you get a prescription for it. Let's move on to our interview with Ron <laughs> Davis uh, with Reactuate Games. So Welcome. Okay, so Ron Davis is the founder of Reactuate Games in Abilene, Texas, the city's first video game company. 
After winning $20,000 from Abilene Christian University's Springboard Idea Challenge, Ron started the company, which is designing a new game demo to be launched in September. Right. So. And this is totally not self-serving for our company to make me the first <laughs> guest <laughs> of our own I podcast. I, I can't think of a better guest to have. I can't think of well, it. The thing guy. is, I, I've done a couple of other podcasts before. I did one on EMS. I did one on model photography. And your first episodes generally kind of suck because you don't know what you're doing <laughs> and you're working it out. And, and when you when you do it the first time, you're like, oh, that's pretty good. you know. But after you've done like about 50 or 60 of them and you go back and you listen to your first one, you're like, oh, man, <laughs> were we saying that? Or what was what was that whole thing? We didn't even know where that was. Where, why didn't we do the, this thing You know that yeah. you do after you iterate and figure out how to – what, what works and what doesn't work. So the idea for me, us, was that there's also the whole technical aspect of recording one and getting all that set up. And really, we didn't want to, like, get somebody to come in to interview, and then we, like, oh, we forgot to turn on the mic, and we never got any of your interview. That would be bad with a, somebody else. So we decided I get to be the guinea pig, and we're also doing it live. In um, it, We're doing it where we're recording the, per, the interviewee in the studio, which probably won't happen for the majority of our interviews because they'll be over Skype. Mm -hmm. But this lets us work out getting the host um, recorded and everything. So so it's good to be a guinea pig. That's why we did it. It's not purely self-serving. Not purely. Not purely. 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 Oh, come on. We're we're doing a podcast. (laughs) That's one of the things about Reaction Games. We're honest. We're creating a podcast so that people will listen to our podcast and they will support our Kickstarter when it comes out and they will buy our video game. So yeah, there's some aspect of it being self-serving for the for the for the company, but it's also we you know I'm not going to create something I don't think serves the community. Mm-hmm. And Angel certainly would not be part of something that didn't serve the community, right? That's Angel, true. that is definitely true. I'm all about the people in the community. So, well, on that note, so out of all the businesses you could have started, why a video game company? Well, because Elon Musk has already done rockets, and it takes way too much money. <laughs> And electric cars. <laughs> All right. Oh, sorry. No. Uh, video games. Uh, this is one of those things where I've always had a game in my head since uh, for probably a decade. And when I actually did the springboard thing last year, and then like totally even didn't I didn't even make it into the rank, the finalists. But when I did it this year, I was like, I'm gonna instead of sitting around trying to think of a business that would make a good business plan that might win me a thing. I'm going to write a business plan about a business that I would like to do that I would I would think would be fun. And so that's why I thought it would be fun, and I have this game in my head, and it needs to get out. So that's kind of why Reactuate Games came into being. Mm. So what was the first business plan? <laughs> so you know how they have comedy defensive driving classes? And they have, like, online comedy defensive driving. So you have defensive driving, and you have a comedian do it. I've never had a you, 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 I've never had a ticket. Never uh, had a ticket. Defensive no. driving. Oh wow! I well, may they have, do. I they they have, have defensive driving, and and you know, normally it used to be like really supersonically boring. And the reality is, defensive driving is just an eight-hour jail sentence that you get for your traffic ticket. I mean, that's really the whole point. <laughs> is you true. have to spend eight hours either in a, at a thing, or you have to spend eight hours in front of a computer watching videos. Well, I had this idea. Well, if comedy makes it better. Well, like hot chicks would make it better too. I call it action defensive driving, and it was going to be more. Uh, it was going to have hot chicks. That was that was hot really my underlying thing. Everything better. And for some reason, ACU Springboard did not jump on the idea of funding what? such an enterprise. That's weird. The university wasn't into that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's bias. I think it's just bias. <laughs> wow. Hmm. Still think it was a good idea. I, I think it's I, a good I idea right now. There's like a lot of government bureaucracy about getting set up to do an online defensive driving and being certified and stuff. And one of those is you have to get your curriculum like approved. And that's a, the, the curriculum is written out by them. So the fact that it would actually do it, yeah, that would actually happen. But I did worry a little bit that like state regulators who are approving things are like, and why exactly does your host have to wear a bikini? Um, because she's talking about how heat affects driving (laughs) they lack vision is what i'm thinking yeah it's all about vision Uh, yeah whatever anyway well you said you have this video game in your head so what games and other influences first inspired you to to do what it is that you're doing you know it's interesting because i i have a video game in my head but when i think of what my inspirations are they're not necessarily video games 
Hmm. There were books or movies that I've seen. You know, there's this idea of of creating a video game that's this persistent online world where you're building a colony, and then after you know, if we if we take this to the 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 future as I envision it, then there's like space exploration where like not only do we have one colony, but you get to a point where you're going to go out and find other planets to make other colonies, and that idea, uh, you know, was inspired by a, a couple of authors I like's books called the Layod series, and the thing that inspired me there was they have this idea of people being a master trader or being a scout, and master traders, you get that designation as a, a trader among planets by the other traders voting you in, saying that, yes, he is that competent, and I liked that idea and trying to ca- incorporate that into a video game. Another idea inspiration was there was a short story written by Orson Scott Card back it was like an analog in the early 80s and it was called The Monkeys Thought It Was All in Fun and the main character of that bought Italy so there was like this game where you paid for a particular country and this game started like in 1900 and you paid for a particular country and then you could control everything about that country as as the century goes on and your actions all reflected on that. And so like he bought Italy before World War I and everybody else spent like big money to buy countries like the United States and Germany and England because they were anticipating World War II. Well, he, he did Italy and he ran such a great country that World War II never happened. <laughs> and eventually uh, he created this like perfect country that expanded peacefully and uh, built up this huge thing. Well, that's the beginning of that short story. And in that short story, you, you to live longer, you went in these like cryogenic naps, and so you would wake up, but you couldn't hold on to your country while you were gone, so you had to sell it. Mm. And then you would first thing he would do when he would wake up is say, buy back Italy. And normally that wasn't a problem because he'd get like his proxy, but then some really rich guy bought his country, bought Italy, and the whole story is about him trying to get Italy back and the guy who bought it slowly destroying it from the inside, oh, man. making all the wrong choices mm-hmm. uh, to do it. And finally, um, he finally gets to talk to the guy. He's like, why are you doing this? And he's going, because Italy is like the perfect government, and the government that we have right now is nowhere near as good as Italy, and I needed to practice. <laughs> destroying a government from the inside because our government is corrupt. So he was he had created this thing in a video game that was like the perfect government and someone from the outside could look at it and say if I can run that wrong I can actually make it happen in the real world. So my idea is could you simulate something so well that, that it would reflect to the real world. Now hopefully people will not like make the perfect colony and in Guardian, and then like use it to learn how to destroy America or something. That, would be bad. that is not our intention. I was going to ask, how was that incorporated in the game that we're creating? Well, just the idea that you could create a perfect economy, mm-hmm. kind of thing. And our, I think our games are going to, our game is ultimately going to be a lot about managing economy. Early on in the in the early stages is about building your cities and stuff. But as that goes on, as your cities get bigger, it's more about like. What do you choose to focus on in the economy? What are you going to be more of a mining person who, who's focused on getting as many minerals as they can and then turning around and selling those to other people? Mm-hmm. Which is another thing that came from a book. Uh, Neil Stevenson has a book called Ream D. So it's Read Me, but two of the letters flipped backwards. Mm-hmm. And in that book, the main character has uh, created a video game where from the ground up he incorporated the idea of being able to turn things from virtual currency into real currency and in reality making it so that Chinese gold farmers could make a living farming gold in this virtual world Mm. and you could transfer back and forth there was an exchange rate between the two Mm. between virtual money and real money and so that idea that you could have that happen too was is an interesting idea uh, I don't know exactly if, if we could make that work, and then if you actually did have a currency that had value, <laughs> yeah. you'd suddenly end up with you know the federal government showing up at your door and saying, you need to be regulated like a bank. But wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't it be awesome to have created a video game and have the federal government come up and say, you have to be regulated like a bank because you have a currency that is so important? And that would be first. 
<laughs> yeah. That would be a first time. But what, what I thought was kind of interesting, though, as you, as you continue to talk, was how you were expressing that different mediums inspired another one. So yeah. books, paper, words have to use imagination inspired you and your creative process to in the digital atmosphere. And so I, I thought that was pretty interesting. But do you think that there's a direct correlation with some of the ideas there and what you're doing with the video games? Or do you view them as two separate things? No, I mean, I think that for video games, there's always the aspect of story in them and narrative. And that's that's the same across platforms. Let's call it platforms. I don't know what you want to call it, right? Yeah. I guess they're media. Like a book is a media, film is a media, medium. Uh, so there is that aspect of it that... They have story, and ours actually, that's probably the, of the, the, there's four kind of characteristics I think of when I'm thinking of video games. Story, mechanic, um, aesthetics, and I always forget one of the four. So mechanic, aesthetics, I used to have this quadrangle. It comes from Jesse Snell. Anyway, there's four of them, and, and, and for us, the, oh, technology. Technology is the four. So technology, aesthetics, story and gameplay mechanic and for us actually the weakest of those is story Mm -hmm. because ours is much more the the player is creating the story of what happens in their colony Mm -hmm. and we're creating a mechanic based on the technology with an aesthetic to allow them to do that Mm -hmm. so that all of those things i do think kind of story is the one you most likely see cross across um across media you know they all have Film has story, mm-hmm. books have story, video games have story. So they all kind of work together. Like freedom of imagination there. So so essentially you're giving them the freedom to create whatever story they want to. Yeah. You're empowering the player. I guess that would be similar with books. As you're reading it, you have the, the freedom to create whatever picture. Yeah. So I used to hate reading books. I didn't have pictures in them. <laughs> it's like, no, I don't want to use my imagination. <laughs> Can I just watch the movie? <laughs> So let me see what what is your creative creative process? Like, how do you go about creating something? Who out came of up with the these air? questions? <laughs> I hate these questions. <laughs> no, um, my creative process. You know, I I don't have like a linear creative process. I like to create different aspects of things that I know are going to intersect with each other, and kind of bring them together, and then see what happens when they intersect. And when we're looking for the in the game space, you know, one way of looking at that is the aspects of we have the coders making code and we have the artists making art. And it's not that they're separate, but they are, and then you kind of bring them together and that's when it becomes a game. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of my process. It's like, what do I, what do we need the next steps for the, the, the coder needs to code? so that we can take the stuff that the artists are creating, what is their next steps to create their steps. And it may, often it seems like we've got things going off in like five different directions and it doesn't look like they're ever going to be anything, but but once they all get together at the right time, then they become a cohesive whole of one thing. So that's kind of my the way I think about it and the way it seems to work out. And in a way, it's the way the game works, right? <laughs> it's like you, there's not a linear story. I mean, we've worked on a pretty linear kind of tutorial series for the early levels of the game, just to teach them how to play the game. But in the end, it's like I'm going to create buildings and they're going to do things and units and they're going to do things. And I'm not telling you what that's going to end up being. Mm-hmm. There's no end game in this, right? There's no here's like when you'll be finished. It's you're building a thing and um, you can keep building that thing forever if you want. You've worked on a previous game, haven't you? I did like an update project? for a game, a mobile game for an author based on his book. Uh, it was uh, the Better Man app from Neil Strauss, and it was uh, it was a social game because in a way, what it was there, it was actually designed to uh, give the player tasks to make him a better man, hmm. and to teach him sort of how to talk to women and. I mean, like, you're literally your first mission. I think your first mission in that game is just to say hello to, uh, like, five people that you meet. Uh, I could have used that app when I was younger. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, it goes, it goes the, the, and they get progressively more involved in social interactions. But, like, 
one of the early missions is also uh, you need some better basically you need some better clothes dude it's like clothes aren't everything but you need to dress better so go get expert advice go to a place go to a like a store and ask the women who work there for recommendations on what or no just ask women on recommendations on where they where you should go buy clothes Mm. and that's all you got to do is just ask that and then then go there and ask them the people at the place for recommendations so it's kind of an interesting progression uh and has a lot of interesting aspects to it but yeah i just did the updates for that okay See, I thought you had worked on something else because, you know, now you're on this project. So from your experience, what makes a good game developer? <laughs> I'm not sure I'm the, good, the guy to ask that because I haven't really <laughs> Long done a lot of game development <laughs> or worked with a lot of game developers. But I would expect that, in, that tenacity is probably the most important thing. Mm. Mm-hmm. And it's down to true life, right? It's tenacity that makes you successful, not brilliance necessarily. Or edu- your education, it's the, I'm not going to stop until it's done. Mm-hmm. Tenacity of things. So are you saying you're not a game developer? I haven't been. I am now. So what, what, <laughs> what defines a game developer? That your end product is a video game. <laughs> that to me, that's, I mean, literally, that's a game developer, right? So I'm a software do developer. I've written shrink wrap software that that you could go, well, probably not now because nobody buys software on the shelf of a store anymore. But uh, I've written software that does, I've written antivirus software. I've worked on compilers and development environments. Mm -hmm. I've uh, written font management utilities. So I've I've worked on a lot of different kind of software projects. But this is the first one that's been a video game. So you're officially a game developer now? I am now. Okay, that's I am what officially I was kind of curious developer. about. Like, and game what, designer and all those other aspects of it. Yeah, because if we have a digital artist and then we have a code artist, you know, does game developer encompass all of that? Uh, I think it's a little split in hairs. I don't know. Mm-hmm. We could get down in the semantics. Is, are the artists game developers? And a lot of people use the term game developer for the people who lead the whole project. A game designer and game developer would be similar. But then developer is like a term you use to describe someone who does software development. Mm -hmm. And that's generally a coder. But, like, the reason we don't call our coding person, like, a software engineer, which has been the title I've had at most of the companies I've ever been in, is because I consciously wanted to show that in a game company, the guy writing the code is just as much an artist as the person creating 3D software it's a different medium but it's the same thing they're the guys who bring it to life if you Mm. don't have that and it's it's an artistic endeavor not just a technical one Uh, that's an interesting philosophical perspective right Mm -hmm. there yeah i never thought of it that way because it is a form of art coding is no joke yeah well speaking of no joke and difficulties and transitioning into something new since you've you've become a game developer what has been the most difficult thing or the most trying that's that makes you feel as though you have to have that tenacity in order to be a, game, a successful game developer? The hardest thing, the thing that requires tenacity, the hardest thing I've had to do has been the kind of thing that you have as a business problem, not as a, a game developer problem. Mm. Um, just uh, personnel issues in this case. So that to me was the thing that was the hardest and required tenacity to come back to work, you know, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think second to that will will be September and going through Kickstarter. Yeah. And everything's on the line there. So we were talking about it yesterday. It's like, so what's your plan B, Ron? I'm like, I can't even think of a plan B. I have no idea what plan B is. (laughs) I have no idea, really. So So you were talking about personality differences and such. Um, What should others know, uh, those who want to go into this industry? What kind of mentality do they have to have or personality traits I think one thing is there are a lot of people who are kind of want to be game developers right they like video games and they would love to work in the video game industry and they would love to be game developers but they aren't willing to put in the work to become that kind of person mm. um, in the end you still have to have skills mm. yeah, and those skills are acquired the same way all other skills are which is studying it you know either formally in in a college experience or a school experience or informally by spending all your free time writing code or all your free time learning your 3d software and making models Uh, another aspect of it too uh, 
I mean, with the with the coder side of it, I think there's wannabes that think it's easy and it's not easy to write code. I think it takes kind of a certain mentality. I'm not, and I'm pretty sure people can learn it, but most people just don't want to learn the, the mm-hmm. mentality it takes to be a good coder. And I think with artists, a lot of things I see with people are like, oh, I want to be a video game artist. And so I, I'm i working on, I want to be a concept artist and I want to paint pretty, as I paint pretty pictures of how video games should look. And to me, I look at that and I'm like, that's like saying, oh, I want to be a TV broadcaster, so I'm practicing to be the head of NBC, yeah. you know, the NBC news anchor, but I don't know how to run a camera like I'm going to have to do in a local market. It's just they're they're setting themselves their only mean, their only skill that they're working on in video game development is the one skill that's like the top of the artist food chain, mm-hmm. being a concept artist. And... All, and a concept artist makes pretty pictures, and then he passes it off to somebody else with a different set of skills that turn them into video games. And you just don't walk in off the street and do that. But you can look at a lot of like job boards on, uh, and uh, if you go to GDC, I went to GDC, a lot of, they have a lot of people who are hiring there. And if you walk in and you can create 3D models, it's, if, if you show that you've got even beginner level talent in that, Though there's jobs for you, you know, they get portfolios of people who draw lots of pretty pictures, and they're like, "We don't have a role for you to draw pretty pictures. Can you like use 3DX Max to to make a robot?" Mm-hmm. And they're like, uh, "No, I don't know how to use that tool. That tool is hard to learn, man. It's really confusing." <laughs> and they're just like, "I'm sorry, we don't have a position for you." But if you come in and you pop down your i your uh, your iPad and you start flipping through animations of a robot. People are going to be like, yeah, you know, we'll talk to you again because you obviously have the basic, basics of skills, and I think we can use those. It's it's one of those things where you need to look, if you're looking for a job in the game industry, you need to look at what the companies need. You need mm-hmm. to get your foot in the door, um, and the best way to do that is to have some the basic skills that are hard to have. Do you think also it, it may come into that it's really not articulated that you have to start at a lower level or look at a lower level job before you can get to the the jobs that people want or do you might even believe it to be that people don't know that a concept artist is a higher level job maybe they just know these buzzwords and they say that's what I want to be I think that that may there may be an aspect of that that people don't understand concept artists being kind of at the top and they don't understand all the terms for the different artists. I didn't understand all the terms. Like when I named my guys coding artist, I posted something to Reddit, and they were like, "Is this a technical artist position?" And I'm like, "What's a technical artist?" <laughs> and I looked it up, and a technical artist is like a, a person who can code and do art. And and there's like a whole that's a whole area there, you know. So when you like do particle systems, for instance, in a game engine. A technical artist is probably going to do those particle systems because it's kind of a it's a technical job where you have to understand algorithms and stuff like that. But you also have to understand the artistic aspect of making particles flying around look cool. Mm. So there's there is actually a job that's that's half artist, half coder, called a technical artist, and that's a position that's common in companies. But I'd never heard of it before. Right. I, I, I named mine, but I think that that is a lack of uh, understanding of what all these positions are, and I think. The industry is still young, and it's still working on those titles. So that you don't know what a technical artist is. Is a technical artist at Bungie the same as a technical artist at Microsoft? Mm, I don't know. I Probably in those two cases. No, not those two cases. Um, yeah, Bungie. I was thinking uh, Blizzard. Is mm. a technical artist at Blizzard the same as one at Microsoft? I'm, I'm my bet in the ones Microsoft <laughs> and Bungie. They're probably the same since they used to be the same company. But. <laughs> Uh, you say tomato, I say tomato. Yeah. Eh, same, same. See, that's what they, they shouldn't have both named themselves, begin with a B. So you, you said that you went to GDC, and for those people who don't know, what, what is GDC, what does that stand for, and why did you, as a game developer, go there? Um, it's the Game Developers Conference. Well, there you go. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> it's uh, the biggest uh, uh, conference for people in the gaming industry. It's in San Francisco every year. I went last year, and I was also uh, a conference associate. Mm. So what happened was I decided to start <laughs> Reactuate Games. And, you know, if you didn't know this, going to a conference in San Francisco ain't cheap. No, no. The conferences themselves are generally the top of whatever, you know, or industry they're in. So their own tickets cost thousands of dollars. I think GDC's tickets are like two grand. 
and uh, then you have to like get a hotel in downtown uh, downtown San Francisco for a week, which is probably about another two grand. Well, I was decided I should probably go to an industry thing and learn more about that particular industry. And GDC was coming up. And I was like, I really want to go to GDC, but I can't really afford that. I can't afford like four grand for a week in San Francisco. And I, I found out there was this thing called conference associates. And what they are are people who volunteer to work the conference. So you check people's badges and you help people out. Matter of fact, one of the things you do is that you wear this bright yellow shirt. It changes in color, but it's always like a fluorescently colored mm-hmm. shirt. And last year it was yellow. And on the back it says, ask me, I can help. And so you're basically saying at any time you're walking around in that shirt, anybody at that show can ask you for help and you will find, you'll get it for it. Um, it's really well run. That program has been around for like 20 years. And it's, I was, I went to Ian, the guy who runs it at the end there and said, I got to tell you, this is from a leadership point of view, this is one of the best or best led organizations I've ever seen. The mm-hmm. CAs. I was, I was really impressed on how they made it fun and they got things done, and they inspired this culture of helping anybody who asked, you know, no matter what your problem was. You need to figure out where the bathroom is, we'll tell you where that is. You know, you lost your laptop, we'll help you find out where you go to do that. <laughs> so no matter what it was, that they really inspired you to find, um, to do that. And then everybody hung out all night long uh, and played games in the lounge in Moscone Center. So anyway... That was actually a, a really great experience to go to GDC and to be a conference associate, and I would recommend being doing those to anybody. But it's just an application process, and like 4,000 people apply, and oh, they have yeah. 300 um, associates. But they do also, every year, like a third of their associates have to be new. So it's not just that everybody returns and you have to wait for someone to die off or something. <laughs> I'm not necessarily a gamer. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm an outsider, right? Mm-hmm. So for those people who are, quote, outsiders, what would you share with them about this gaming community? What should they know about people that love this stuff? Uh, oh, man, that's a tough one. Because my first thought is, we're not as bad as it looks like <laughs> in the press. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Angel knows what I'm talking about. It's like uh, there is an aspect of the people that are considered gamers mm. in the gaming community that they're the trolls of the Internet and uh, they're sexist and um, mean and talk trash and are all live in their mother's basement. That's the idea. But that, to me, that's those are just the, the newsworthy people, right? The people that make an interesting news story, that there are thousands, uh, millions of people who play video games who are completely well-adjusted and nice people and will help you out. Uh, so the, as far as the community goes, don't believe the press. Instead, go and, and uh, experience it for yourself. The other is that the stereotype of, of gamers as being these teenage boys uh, kind of thing is totally wrong. If you look at the stats... Uh, video gaming is at least 50-50 split male and female uh, the age range is all through life it's funny, Angel and I go to uh, Toastmasters together and one of the guys in our Toastmasters is 70 something and mm-hmm. and uh, anytime I talk about video games he's like, yeah I play video games man I'm in Second Life and I sell jewelry on Second Life and I have like wow and if you get him talking about his wow characters man it's he will rap. just go off it's talking about I'm like a 70 <laughs> level and a 90 level this and a 70 level that and he's like man he's got like this big gray beard and he's like in his 70s and it's like there's no it's it totally breaks the stereotype of gamers so that kind of thing that's kind of interesting though if, if you how would you even define that term you know when somebody says what is a gamer how do how would you define that you know from a we'll do it this way from a game developer's perspective if i ask you what is a gamer and then i want to hear it from from you just as ron how do you define gamer well if, we, if that definition is even different well we as a company have had to sit down and this was from a marketing point of view but it applies just as much from a game design point of view we created what they call in marketing an avatar which is a specific person that we made up but a specific person with a specific age and 
what they do for a living. His name is Caleb, and he's a relationship banker. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he has a live-in <laughs> girlfriend named Stacy. And when he buys, goes to buy a video game, he has to justify that expense to Stacy. Mm-hmm. Uh, when he wants to spend time playing his game, uh, he may, what, what other things is he going to have to put, you know, he's going to have to choose to play our game versus versus doing something else. You know, is he going to choose to play a video game rather than go pick, do a pickup game of basketball with his buddies? Mm-hmm. Uh, is he going to play our, get addicted to our game, be playing our game when he should be going out with Stacy? you know? And, mm. I don't and, like this Stacy already. And, she's you know. a very nice young woman. Oh, she is, is she, huh? She is. Okay. So we, you know, it's interesting because it's, it's, a, it's a mental exercise to do that. So for us as a game company and as a game developer, we, we have tried to narrow, we have to try to create an imaginary person who is in his mid-30s, mid-20s, late-20s. He's in his late-20s. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and try to get inside his head and what are the, the, the decisions he's having to make that relate to our game and why would he want to play our game. Like, he's a relationship banker, which is kind of a, you know, that's, I would pick relationship banker because it's one of those terms, right? right? It's like, you know, the big bank that he works for. Like, we got to make a, a, our bankers warmer and fuzzier, so we're going to call them <laughs> relationship bankers. And you know that kind of probably rubs him a little raw. It's like, oh, man, I am in this, like, this big soulless corporation. And I, you know, studied in school, and now I'm out of school. And do I want to go back to school so I can get an MBA so I might get further up the corporate ladder? Mm-hmm. And one of the things I want to do to get away from that is I want to build something and do something that feels like it matters. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the reasons people play video games, right? Is to feel like what they're doing is cool or it, it matters. So you got that aspect of it too. Uh, so that's for how we define gamers for our company. We try to get very specific. And that by getting or increasing that specificity, does that motivate you towards specific goals or direction or is that uh, I don't know impact the type of game that you want to make or well from game to, from the game developer side for me from the game designer side uh, it, it makes me have to think about how much time is a gaming session mm. uh, how often do you have to come back to this one of the interesting ideas for uh, our video game guardian idea would be to have like a mobile aspect that's not playing the game but it's being able to monitor your your economy and maybe tweak some things uh where so that when you're just sitting there you can whip up your the mobile app and go oh you know what my where i don't have enough warehouses man i need to throw some more warehouses in the queue without having to pull up the full game uh so that 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 would allow them to stay connected without having to like you know, block out another hour of their day to play the game. Mm. So the idea that there's that point of view, um, so and from, then I would say from a personal point of view, what's yeah. a gamer? Uh, lots of people are gamer, and they're all different kinds. <laughs> of, you know, it's funny whenever I say that, I always think, you know, what you guys need to do? You need to watch Video Game High School, which is this <laughs> web series that's put out by Freddie Wong and Rocket Jump. And in the funny thing about it is it's about this high school. Like, if you, there was a high school for people who play video games, that would be the high school, right? But the cliques in this high school are all the different kinds of video games. So there's the first-person shooter team, <laughs> right? Uh, there's the casual gamers who are, like, Farmville and stuff, you know? And there's the, dr- the racing game guys, the drifters. Yeah. And it's interesting to, to look at that because... I mean, even watching that game, like, oh, wow, that's right. There are guys who just like, they just like to play racing games. They don't like to play anything else, you mm-hmm. know? And there's the sim guys who only play sims. And then there's strategy people who only play strategy mm-hmm. games. So there's just this huge swath of different ways that you could do video games and play video games. And, you know, as a game developer, you're not writing, I'm not trying to write a game that everybody in the world wants to play. You know, for mm-hmm. people who love first person shooters probably don't want to play Guardian. Mm-hmm. Um, but people who play StarCraft might, would like to play might, you like to play Guardian because it continues on, mm-hmm. and it's not just all over when your session's over. I like that. So let me ask the the outsider here: When you hear gamer, what what do you think? What are you thinking about? Before I started this job, honestly, I had a stereotype in mind. Um, oh, what, you, what what was, what was the stereotype? Yes. Have we seen Live Free Die Hard? With yeah. oh. Are you thinking Kevin, Kevin Smith? Smith. <laughs> in the basement, thousands of TV screens. Uh, yeah, living in his mother's basement. 
that's that's what my idea of gamer was. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I've known casual gamers that you know, and I've I've played games, but that was always my idea. If you're going to give yourself a title, then you are really passionate about that thing, that hobby. Like I'm a writer, I'm really passionate. So that's what I did with gamer. Um, now, I'm seeing I'm seeing kind of this broad spectrum of of gamers. Right? You do have your people who like to play apps all the time. Um, you have your Sims people. So I see it as more uh, just people that enjoy maybe just playing, you know, mm-hmm. being distracted for a little bit, getting out of reality. Okay. I like that. So let's get, let's get to the nitty gritty, ask some personal questions here <laughs> that all gamers want to know. So you have some time, you have free time, right? And you need to burn this free time. What game would you play? Uh, my favorite video game to play, it's my, my comfort game. You know, the one you go back to when you want to like, do something mind-numbing. Like when you have books, sometimes you go back to your comfort books and you'll reread these books over and over again. Oh, yeah, I understand. The only game, the, my, my personal favorite, and the one I go back to is Borderlands. <laughs> yeah, we were talking about The that. Borderlands, Borderlands 2, those are, my, those are my favorite games. Which is funny because those are first-person shooters, and I'm not, I'm not making a first-person shooter, <laughs> right? Uh, and if the other game that I like to play uh, recently have liked to play is uh, the Saints Row, the last one. Oh, that's uh, that's Gat a game about ridiculousness. Yeah, and the the thing about it, and if you notice the two thing, the thing about both those games is they kind of have this dark sense of humor to yes. them. Yes, they they're, do. they're they're first person shooters, and you're shooting things all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, like one of the missions in Borderlands 2 is to like go find this particular character and shoot him in the face because he wants you to. He's the one who gave you that mission. Go find me and shoot me in the face. Shoot me in the face. He's like, yeah, you shoot me in the face. Shoot me in the face. Uh, so you know, it's a it's a it's kind of this dark f- humor, and uh, I, I enjoy that stuff. So those are the yeah, those are the ones. Those are my comfort games. I like that. You said something about books too. Having a comfort book. Yeah. Do you have a comfort book? I don't have one. Uh, but I'm a big science fiction guy, mm-hmm. and so I've got a lot of science fiction books. But when I go back and reread things, it'll be I'd probably reread books from the Layod series by uh, Miller and Lee, Sharon, mm-hmm. Steve Miller and Sharon Lee. I have to remember which one's first name goes with the last <laughs> name. Uh, those are it's a good series of books, and often I'll go and reread those books just for the fun of it. And I'm a I'm a Heinlein fan, so I go back to some of his old stuff too. Uh, Starship Troopers, and if you've watched the movie, you know nothing about the book. <laughs> so I, I yeah. like the movie. Yeah, the, the, the movie was blasphemy. I just, uh, you know, it's funny you bring that up, uh, because I watched the movie, and I was a huge fan, and it was pre, pre-military, pre so of course I'm going in, and I'm all hyped up on all these mm-hmm. military movies, to include Starship Troopers, and Rico's Roughnecks, huh? and it'll get all crazy. <laughs> and then I found out that it was actually based off of a book. So I'm like, well, let me go ahead and be this super fan, and let me go read this book. If you read the book, <laughs> it is not the movie. And the it's movie, not even, it's vaguely related. It, like, by, by name, and there's some aliens, kind of. So the aliens better? kind of are bugs. Yeah, I, you know, it's. Which is better? It, you can't, you, it's, because people ask me that, so which one's better? Should I read the book, or should I watch the movie? Mm-hmm. And what I say is, you can do both because each one have nothing to do with the other. <laughs> yeah. So they're two separate yeah. experiences. Yeah, I mean, like you know, the the core, the core of the book is the suit, and the suit is not even in the movie. There's I mean, no like, suit? that's crazy. That is insane. No, no. And then the whole the whole um, history and moral philosophy, like it's like it gives him this whole discussion. He has this whole discussion about like why there needs to be a military. Like in the, in the, in, the, in the book, in the book. Uh, you can't vote if you're not a veteran. Right. And so there's a whole discussion about that. And it, it, the main character, Rico, keeps like having these like, flashbacks to high school where he had to take this right. class, History and Moral Philosophy. And that's a very philosophical book. Well, they took, when they made the movie, they decided that, that Heinlein was writing a parody. That's fascism. <laughs> and he's writing a parody of fascism. And so that's what they turned it into. Mm-hmm. So you notice, like, in the movie, the military that he's part of dressed like Nazis. Mm-hmm. Right, their dress uniforms look like Nazi uniforms. And you're just like, you made a book where the people are not. You took a book and you made the characters into Nazis. 
thought it kind of was satire. It's not. It's that it's, becomes well. A that's the argument. It, that, it was was know. Heinlein's because then he turns around and writes something like Stranger to Strange Land, which is all like free love and hippie stuff, and like he used to have hippies show up at his door because it was like the awesomest hippie book ever, <laughs> and he'd be like, "Get away from me!" You know, because he didn't like the hippies. He thought they were all slackers. Yeah, I, I recommend you read it if you if you want to just think of it as it's something separate, and then you'll you'll appreciate it. Yeah. But it's it's fun to see the difference. So everybody has those comfort games and comfort books. I, I personally read Dune by Frank right. Herbert once a year, every year, because it's relevant and it makes me feel smart and special. <laughs> so I recommend that. And for video games, and I should have broke this up for you too if you were into that, but competitive games and everything else. So I used to be highly competitive in Street Fighter, so I, I sunk hundreds of hours into that. But probably the most comforting game, if you can think of it that way, is God of War. Mm. God of War for me. Love the story. Love the uh, the Greek mythology behind it. The score was was great. So I have the the digital version of the music. So I'll listen yeah. to the music sometimes when I when I want to feel like a badass in my kitchen. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's all good stuff. Yeah. Indeed. Stephanie, what's your comfort book? Stephanie, with the graduate degree in English, English. literature. Um, that's an interesting question because I don't go back and read a lot of the books. I just keep them all, but I don't go back and reread them. Um, I would say a comfort author is Jennifer Weiner, just because y'all haven't heard of her. No, nothing. No, no. Man, <laughs> who, who is this? My references just fall flat. Um, she she writes about young women. I think this is getting off topic, kind of. So there is a gap missing, I think, in literature about young 20-something professional women. You don't see a lot of books out there about them, but she tries to get some out there. You mean like the Bridget so. Jones diaries? 20-somethings. <laughs> She's 30 -somethings. Oh, okay. There's a vast difference. <laughs> Isn't the 30 to new 20? I mean, that's like same, same, right? No, it's not. No, no, we're getting the evil eye right now. <laughs> Which you guys can see what we're seeing right now. <laughs> well, thanks, Ron for doing this for us. Um, and that's it for Say Something Smart Video Game Podcast. I'm Stephanie Whitlow. I'm Angel, the director of Awesome. And thanks for listening. That's a wrap for the Say Something Smart Video Game Podcast. While you're waiting for the next episode, you probably want to check out some of Reactuate Games' other great content. We live stream our development daily on twitch.tv. We also post things to our blog and YouTube almost daily. You can get links to all the things we're doing as well as full show notes at www.reactuategames.com. The podcast executive producer is Ron Davis. Production by Stephanie Whitlow. Hosted by Angel Rodriguez and Stephanie Whitlow. Edited by Stephanie Whitlow. Music by John Shepard of Shepard Studios. Until next time, visit reactuategames.com.